it should work. Okay. But it looks like it's on. It works. It's perfect. Yeah. Is it on or? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for including me in the in this program. And today I was thinking that I could give an overview of uh, uh, um, recent progress uh, as well as a review of the overall um, uh, effort that has uh, been ongoing over the past seven years um, uh, in the development of, a, of an algorithm for large-scale quantum Monte Carlo simulations in the continuum and at finite temperature. Let me start by acknowledging my collaborators. And uh, these are Nikolai Prokofiev and Boris Vistunov, both at University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And let me also acknowledge funding from the National Science Foundation and meager funding from the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, 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 meager, meager. It was very meager. <laughs> right, right, that's right. That's right, that's right. I may have to yeah, seek no political <laughs> asylum. That's right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll be a refugee soon. So um, now the um, let's start with Path Integral Monte Carlo, uh, with which mm, you're all familiar. It's certainly a powerful approach to um, Monte Carlo simulations of many body systems. Uh, in uh, its canonical implementation, you find it described in David Sepperly's uh, Review of Modern Physics article dating back to 1995. So um, why is it? Uh, um, uh, uh, a good choice uh, for simulations of a class of many body systems. So first of all, it's accurate, and it has the quality that it does not call for any adjustable parameter. All you need for input is just a microscopic Hamiltonian. It is unbiased. That might be an advantage over um, ground state methods, although the comparison with ground state methods is tricky, and it has to be done properly. Um, in uh, by unbiased, I mean that there is no a priori uh, assumption needed. You don't need a trial wave function or a trial density matrix most of the time. Um, one would uh, venture to say that for bosons, it is numerically exact. Um, in other words, all of the approximations that are built into the fact that it's a numerical approach, in principle, can be reduced arbitrarily uh, as long as a sufficient amount of CPU time is given and the scaling is not exponential. The one thing that differentiates um, fairly directly from ground state um, methods is that uh, the path into Monte Carlo does not um, focus specifically on the energy. It allows um, for uh, the direct computation of a lot of thermodynamic quantities of interest, including structural, like pair correlation function and static structure factor, as well as things that are experimentally measurable, like the superfluid uh, response and the condensate fraction. Also, uh, by construction, access to imaginary time correlations is fairly straightforward. Um, what are the shortcomings? Um, for a long time, there has been a, a problem of efficiency. Um, and in particular, most of the interesting physics is underlain by many particle permutations. Uh, the most straightforward implementation of this technology uh, requires maybe, uh, maybe a week worth of programming. The problem is really to incorporate quantum statistics. And the sampling of many particle permutations, um, at the way it was proposed initially, scales unfavorably with system size. Also, in the original implementation, in the original prescription, uh, one is stuck in the canonical ensemble. And sometimes it's not a problem, but it's nice to be able to uh, work in the grand canonical ensemble as well. Also, um, it uh, works in, a, in a, the subspace of closed word lines, which means that there is no way of simultaneously evaluating diagonal and off-diagonal correlations, uh, off-diagonal correlations, for example, the one particle green function. So uh, the worm algorithm was, uh, was uh, um, uh, conceived and designed precisely to address these issues. Obviously, uh, it's a quantum Monte Carlo technique, which means that when it comes to fermi fermions, we have a sign problem, and the sign problem stays. This does not do anything in terms of addressing uh, that, although it may, may make perfect sense to, to um, wonder whether this approach somehow opens up some possibilities. I haven't done any of that. Let me give you an outline of what I'll be talking about. 
First of all, I would like to give the basics of the worm algorithm. Uh, and I would like to make it clear from the start that the worm algorithm predates uh, Path Integral Monte Carlo. It was invented in, uh, it's actually a lattice uh, technique, um, which was um, conceived initially to overcome critical slowing down for the easy model with only local moves. And it does, uh, without the need any, uh, of any cluster algorithm or anything like that. I'll be happy to talk about, yes, sir. Yeah. If you're getting into really, I mean, the cluster algorithm decreased the, the exponent is slowing down, but it was completely slow. There is still a tiny exponent, even for those methods. Is it really true that it completely wipes out the... That is, what, that is how I have been uh, sold it. I assume that it is. It is in the lit it's a statement that you find in the literature. Um, we'll check it out. Yes, absolutely, right. The n n nice thing about it is that it's local, only local moves on a lattice. Okay, we'll yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so I'll be mm, telling you about Ira and Masha, and maybe now they are part of the folklore here, but uh, they are essentially the two dangling ends of the worm algorithm. And then I'll be discussing a bit the Monte Carlo sampling moves in some details, and I will talk about classical, um, can uh, canonical and grand canonical implementations. Then I would like to describe a few applications, and the most important, of course, is the superfluid transition in helium-4. But I'll be also talking about superfluidity uh, at or near extended defects in solid helium, because that is perhaps the most important application in recent time in the context of the effort to understand the possible supersolid phase of helium. And also I would like to talk about specific um, uh, uh, situations in which exchanges are very important, and one may actually miss uh, um, crucial physics by not being able to sample permutations accurately. So this is not only important in terms of uh, the superfluid transition, but also the structure sometimes of specific systems. And then I'll discuss open issues. So we are talking about quantum statistical mechanics. So uh, the goal is to calculate accurately um, thermodynamic averages for many particle systems. All right. So uh, we just start from uh, Feynman space-time formulation of quantum statistical mechanics. And for example, you can find it you know, illustrated fairly directly in, in this reference. And uh, so uh, the idea is calculating thermal averages. And let's uh, fix already the units. We are at finite temperature, and t is equal to 1 over beta. And so that's the standard prescription. You have to evaluate this ratio, the trace of O rho divided by the trace of rho. And uh, in, co in the coordinate representation, we can, we can write it like that. And a row of R, R, and beta is, the, uh, is a diagonal matrix element, and it's known as the many-body density matrix. And I'm going to write here um, K instead of H, because I'm directly using, immediately using the grand canonical Hamiltonian. So I have a chemical potential, mu, which is an input to my uh, calculation. Capital R is understood as a system configuration. I'm assuming I'm, talking, I'm uh, dealing with spinless particles. Uh, this is really um, a discussion mostly of Bose systems. I'll be talking about uh, some of the issues that come up uh, when one wants to simulate fermions. But uh, for the time being, let me forget about the spin. Yes, sir. No. Where is it? Do you change them the particle? You see, capital R goes from one to ten. So um, right, but n is variable. So you change the particle number during yeah. the simulation with the yeah. Okay, yeah. I need to explain that. Right. Grand so, huh? Grand see, yeah, we are in the grand canonical ensemble. Why did you miss some sum? Where is why it? Why don't you use second quantization? Yeah, the sum you see, why do you use quantum representation? Why do I have to use second quantization? I think it's also, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's perfectly equivalent, it's perfectly equivalent. So and z is the grand partition function, and so, uh, so I'm, I have to summon the number of particles. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, here is. Yeah. yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah, yeah, I forgot that. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, uh, the problem with one uh, wants to do path integrals is that, uh, of course, the, we have that object, the many-body density matrix. 
and the many body density matrix is unknown for any non-trivial uh, system. So one has to uh, obtain it through uh, path integration following uh, Feynman's recipe. So this becomes the uh, integral over all possible paths. I suppose here we are in a sector of fixed n, uh, integrating over all possible paths. And uh, the, the pa each path is weighted by that, by that um, uh, uh, object. So we have uh, uh, imaginary time u h bar, and the Boltzmann constant is set to 1. And we are integrating over all possible continuous beta periodic many particle paths. And the action is given by the integral from 0 to beta h bar of this object, which is the Euclidean action. So the Euclidean action S, is, uh, um, uh, which is associated to a path, uh, is essentially a balance between the kinetic energy, which is the first term, and the kinetic energy uh, is a measure of the curvature of the path, and the potential energy, which of course depends on the interactions. Um, and this integration covers the, the, the path. And usually, uh, smooth, straight paths have higher prob generally higher probability because have, they have a lower kinetic energy. But on the other hand, of course, uh, uh, there is a, a contribution of the potential energy. The higher the potential energy, the lower the probability of a given path. Now, uh, a crucial ingredient here consists of the incorporation of quantum statistics. And, uh, um, you know, for example, let's uh, look at uh, this situation. Let's say we have uh, um, a system of four particles moving in one dimension with periodic boundary conditions. And these are the so-called world lines, the paths associated to each particle. And you see that the initial and final uh, positions are the same, but particles have traded place. Uh, and of course, in one dimension, this can only happen through the periodic boundary conditions, whereas in two and three dimensions, it is possible to have exchanges without invoking um, uh, the, the, the boundary conditions. So. Um, the, uh, why do we need that? Well, because it's a crucial ingredient of the physics of uh, ensembles of indis- Yeah? Can cross tools. Say that again. But the lines can cross. The, the, the exchange can happen only through the boundary. Right. I, it's, they, they can cross. it's true. That for free particles, they can. In general, uh, you're quite right. So let me correct it. Uh, we are assuming that we have hardcore, uh, hardcore potentials, which prevent exchange uh, of that kind. So um, a, a crucial ingredient of the physics of ensembles of indistinguishable particles is, uh, is the, the, the ability of sample permutations, which underlie phenomena such as Bose-Einstein condensation and superfluidity. Now, um, I would like to say that oftentimes one ends up ascribing physical content to these paths, which is uh, something tempting, but it is dangerous because these are not actual, actual real-time paths. But it's qu a lot of questions that have been asked uh, at talks have to do with that. Um, the uh, basic Monte Carlo strategy uh, consists of the following. One, uh, um, generates paths and uh, a sample many particle paths, each path is R of U, uh, through a configuration space based on a probability distribution which is proportional to the exponential of minus the action divided by H bar. And one does that using the Metropolis algorithm, which is a very well-known prescription of, of, of uh, numerical physics. And once one has a large set of paths, one can evaluate thermal expectation values as a statistical average of uh, quantities of interest computed along the path. So that is basic standard Monte Carlo. It's the same as classical Monte Carlo, except that instead of having individual positions for particles, one has paths. Now, um, one huge difference, one important difference between lattice and continuum is that in the continuum, one does not have the problem of uh, time discretization. One can formulate uh, the uh, algorithm so that there is going to be no time step error. Uh, on, uh, uh, in the continuum, there is no such luxury, and so one has to discretize the action integral. And therefore, in the continuum, at least for the time being, we have inevitably a time step error. In practice, this doesn't prove to be a, a terrible problem, but it is there. Um, so uh, by discretization, we mean that the generic path consists of sets of positions of all the particles in the system at uh, different um, uh, imaginary times. 
and uh, the requirement of beta periodicity uh, is uh, uh, implemented by assuming that the final position be the same as the initial position except for a possible relabeling of particles. That is a permutation. So here, the imaginary time beta, the full imaginary time beta, is divided in m slices, and tau is the so-called time step. One has to approximate the, the action integral, and the simplest approximation is this one. And there are better approximations, but we don't need uh, to get into that for the purpose of this discussion. I'll be happy to talk about this in the discussion session. Uh, this is the simplest possible um, um, discretization of the integral. Now, if uh, there is no interaction, of course, the discretization becomes exact, but at that point you don't need it. In the presence of, of uh, um, interaction, this would be accurate to order tau cubed. So the idea is that uh, at this point we have all that we need and we can uh, discrete, uh, sample paths, discrete paths through uh, imaginary time. Uh, from a probability density proportional to e to the minus s of, r, s of r of u. And this can be written in this way. We have a product of three particle um, density matrices, uh, uh, each one for, each, uh, for, for every particle, and each one between two adjacent time slices. And this is the free particle propagator. And then we have a product of potential energies evaluated along the path. And the potential energy, of course, involves a term having to do with a number of particles. Now, in the simplest version, uh, U is just the total potential energy. If you use fancier approximations for the uh, short time or propagator, then this could depend on tau explicitly. Like, for example, in the pair product approximation of Seppel and Pollock. Now, in conventional path integral Monte Carlo, and here I'm going to use a, a, a cartoon, um, what you do is the following. You sample um, paths by having elementary moves that modify portions of the path. Like, for example, you could chop off uh, between these two points and regrow an, an additional path, a portion of path, and accept or reject uh, according to the usual metropolis test. Now, the idea is the following. How do I get paths like this one, for example? And the only way is to chop off two portions that are parallel and attempt a reconnection like shown here. Now, this is the simplest case. Uh, in general, there is an important uh, uh, issue that in the presence of a repulsive hardcore potentials, and this seems to be the case of interest most of the time, like helium-4, hard spheres, there, this, this is where you have phenomena like superfluidity. Um, any technique to sample permutations in this way is bound to become inefficient, that is, to, to face a high likelihood of rejection, because there are hardcore. The potentials have hardcore, and it is very difficult to sample a path where no two particles will come will close to each other. Yes? Uh, well, yeah, you can. You can try tricks like that, and David has tried that for 20 years. The problem is that it, it, most of the time, since you're trying to sample in an unbiased way, you end up constructing paths that, that uh, have this problem. Typically, what you do is the following. You have your initial configuration. You start from one particle, and you sample a possible reconnection of the other, with other particles. And then you have to find a, ma a permutation mate for the other particle and continue until you close the cycle. You only have that much control because you don't want to bias your calculation. And so the likelihood of uh, you know, hitting a uh, uh, hard, hard wall is very high. But yeah. about no, no, no. Uh, at this point, where I'm just showing what the idea is in one dimension, but you do exactly the same in, in, in more dimensions. It is, poss no, the, it is certainly possible to have a permutation that does not involve two hard cores it hitting each other. The fact is, most of the permutation that you sample, because you want to be unbiased, this is Monte Carlo, the, most of the time you will construct permutations that do have this problem, especially if you try to construct large permutations that are the ones that under, under, underlie most of the important physics. <laughs> Right, right. Very low probability, actually. 
right, exactly. There is, so there is some, I, I don't believe there is a, a, a rigorous mathematical statement that has been made about it. Empirically, the, there, is, there seems to be an exponential decrease of efficiency with a number of particles. Yeah, there are papers on exponential problems. In research, like, is that right? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, but empirically, it seems to be the case. If it has, yeah. Right. But you know, I could take one portion and attach to another portion, and so on and so forth. Eventually, I should be able to build a long, a long path. If I didn't have hardcore. So yeah. In fact, uh, you know, people did a lot of simulations for. Um, uh, called gases, where you have interactions that are very short-ranged, all right? And uh, they did a large number of uh, particles using this particular approach and did not have that particular, that particular problem. So. Even if you do electrons, then, which have a, a hard core, mm -hmm. they're pretty efficient. But if you try it with helium, like, uh, I, I mean, my, in my experience, the separately approach, you have maybe Ten thousand tempted moves, and it was, was one acceptor that you had about your. And for electrons, I'm not sure. I haven't seen anything with uh, electrons. I mean, are you talking about Magro and separately, for example? No, no. I mean, I, we, uh, we've been running like the homogeneous electron gas, mm -hmm. and and there we tried both, uh, mm. but the, the 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 separately approach works okay. Mm. Okay. Because it's not, it's just not as repulsive. Okay. So But what quantities are you measuring that depend on quantum statistics? That's the question. Uh, we talk about that. Mm, OK. The momentum distribution, presumably. Uh, we can talk about mm, it. Okay. OK. Yes, sir. Um, I'm wondering if people have used ideas from genetic algorithms. So it seems to me that you can do uh, recollection yeah. easily, for example, change in segments. You see, not having the crossing. You see, same with cut. You can have two cuts, you see, into life, and then them like that, it's like what is one, for example, do that, like DNA does. It is extremely efficient, it's the most efficient way to exchange information between lines, and this is what you want to do. So I'm wondering if anybody tried that. Well, I, I think they tried, and it, it's a, it doesn't really work. I mean, in the sense that it, they, it, that's... It should work, because that's nature proof is the most efficient way. Okay, so go, so tell it, <laughs> go tell it to David Seppeli, what can I tell you? I mean, uh, no. people have tried that, to cut, to chop off, and try to reconnect. If you have a hard core, it seems to be a problem. Hey, yeah, go ahead. Maybe there's room for an original <laughs> contribution. You know, this reminds me a little bit of like if you are looking for a reaction in, you know, if a molecule breaks down or gets together, you, know, you never know where the, where the path is, so to speak. Right. So what they do is so-called nudged uh, elastic, band. elastic band thing. You put like an elastic band from one point to another. And of course, it lies somewhere in here, the, the potential energy, I mean, the energy goes out of group. Uh -huh. And now you start to uh, relax the, the, the band and basically slide along the ridge line into a, like a path or a stable point yeah. on the energy surface, which yeah. is the now one. imagine doing that and keeping track of the weight so that you have an unbiased metropolis. That's, I, mean, <laughs> I know, right? I know. But I'm just trying to think. Like, right, you know, no, no, yeah. Isn't there any way that you would actually put in the geometry in but to, to, to uh, sort of push you in the right direction? Uh, again, I mean, if uh, it is very much interaction dependent. So, I mean, there are certain cases in which uh, things are, are not as bad, okay? Yeah. In general, however, I think it is fairly understood that in the presence of hard core, uh, the winding number is topologically locked. Maybe that's one way right, to say right, it, okay? It is, and it so, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to do much. That's the thing, okay? Okay, that's good. In the canonical ensemble. So actually, these problems are for hard core bosons. Bosons with very strong repulsion. Uh, the, the fermions with attraction, you wouldn't have problems, so you can make them. 
presume, I, I do not know because we haven't Part done. Exactly, exactly. That's the thing. Experimentation with fermions. But uh, people have done calculations for Coulomb bosons, okay? Um, not sure. There is no real. Right. But there, even there, there is no real comparison of efficiency between the two approaches, okay? But the point, I think that the, the real point here is that while somehow you can expect that you, you, you should have no exchange, essentially, what you're looking are paths that somehow stay someplace around some minimum action path, in any case. Uh, uh, here, you, this, is, this doesn't hold anymore. I mean, you have to jump essentially from, from one sector to the next in, in permutations. And uh, uh, I think that, that is, it is either hard or it's not, in the sense that uh, the, the interaction that you, that you use shouldn't matter too much. That's hard by itself. Because you have to, to, to dump, uh, so, I mean, the way you want. Exactly. Well, we should let them continue. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but, no, but these are, after all, this is exactly what, got, you know, what this is all about. Um, that's right. <laughs> so, um, w assuming that one has a problem, okay, with sampling, then there are additional consequences. Namely, one, the superfluid fraction is connected to winding of paths through boundaries, and the occurrence of non-zero winding requires some macroscopic permutation cycle. The length of the cycle should be typically n to the power 1 over d, where d is the dimensionality. So the effort required to sample macroscopic permutation cycles, I write here scales exponentially. Well, you said there, is, uh, there are more robust theoretical statements made to that effect. Uh, empirically, certainly, it seems to be the case. And as a result, the extrapolation of uh, data to the thermodynamic limit is often problematic. Now, this can be also a, a problem for finite systems, like quantum droplets. Uh, the efficient sampling of permutations can be crucial. I can give you examples with hydrogen clusters, but let's leave this out for the time being. Another problem is the ambiguous interpretation of results, because you don't see any permutations, so you see few permutations. Does it mean that the, phys uh, the physics of the system does not allow for them, or is there an ergodicity problem because the permutations are there, you just can't sample them. So this is uh, the approach taken in this situation. Uh, the worm algorithm um, has the same data structure except for one difference, uh, one, one uh, important difference, and that is the presence of one open word line with two dangling ends. And the two dangling ends are, um, for historical reason, reasons named uh, Ira and Masha. So if you wish, we generalize configuration space uh, going from the configuration space of the partition function, which only has closed lines, to that of the single particle, particle Matsubara green function, which, if you wish, is defined like that. And these are the usual field operators. So we have one open word line. And uh, um, we have two dangling ends. All right. And this allows to identify two fundamental sectors. One is when the two uh, dangling ends reconnect. At that point, you are in the sector of the partition function Z. On the other hand, when you have two dangling ends separated by uh, a number of time slices that are empty, you are in the so-called G sector. So uh, we are going to be simulating in an extended configuration space, moving from the Z to the G sectors. And the sampling of paths occurs through a very simple set of complementary moves. Some of them go from G to Z. Some of them stay within, uh, within G. So I would like to go in detail um, through all of them. Let's begin with the first one. So here we are in the Z sector because we only have closed paths. All right. And what we can do is we can jump to the G sector by opening up, by creating a worm. So this would be Ira, this would be Masha, and these are the uh, creation and annihilation operators. So this is the, these two pairs, and of course we can go back by closing, and we have a pair of updates, open and close. And these are the probabilities with which you accept or, or reject. Now, we are, let's not worry too much about the details. Uh, but let me just say that M0 is the maximum number of slices that, you're, that, you can, uh, that can be affected by the move, all right? And that's something that you, adjust, you adjust in order to have the acceptance rate, um, rate that, you that you wish. 
And uh, the, the uh, C is a constant that is tunable, and you can give yourself the freedom of deciding how often you want to be in the Z sector versus the G sector. That's your choice. It won't affect the final uh, outcome of the, of the simulation. It, will simply affect, it might simply affect uh, the error bar. Then let's continue. Then we have, again, we are back to the Z sector. Another thing that we can try to do is insert a particle. See, this is the, the one of the moves that uh, affect the number of particles. So you can create uh, an open uh, path and uh, with an arbitrary number of, of, uh, of slices. Uh, again, the maximum length is a parameter that you pick. And the, the, um, the uh, complementary move is the one that deletes it. So we have insert and remove. And the probability with which they are uh, accepted is, again, this one. Every time you go from the Z to the G sector, you have the constant C. Again, that is something that, that uh, you tune. And then, of course, you have to take into account the change in potential energy and in the number of particles along the, the section of path that you have either in inserted or, or um, uh, removed. Uh, then we have, uh, now we are in the G sector to begin with. And one move that we have is just uh, creating additional time slices. So uh, Ira and Masha can both advance and recede in imaginary time. And here it's very simple. The complementary move is this one. And one stays in the G sector in this particular case. So if you look at the probabilities, you see that you do not have C, the, the constant C anymore because you're staying in the, in the, in the G sector. <laughs> Now, this is perhaps the most important move as far as the um, uh, achieving permutations, uh, um, the, the, which is, of course, the goal here is concerned. So you have this initial situation, all right? You have Ira and Masha, and you have the swap move, which does, ex does that. So you have reconnected Ira here, and now Ira jumps right there. And in this way, it can jump word lines, OK? That is, I believe, what makes the difference. And so Ira and Masha can go around and finally reconnect only when it is energetically favorable. By the time that happens, you have created already a very long cycle. That's the thing. You do not have to go through. Because in principle, you can create a large uh, per cycle of permutations by simple two-particle permutations. Because a pro a a any permutation can be broken down into particle permutations. But the fact is each and every one of these two-particle permutations is very difficult to, to sample. So here we go. Uh, we, 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 Mm -hmm. You see, I can take the two lines. You see, no, no, it stays there on that line. It's the same, okay. No, no, I, I want to stay there. But now what I want to do, I want to exchange the two lines between these two word lines. Forget about here and Masha. Since I'm doing this within the time slice, which I don't have access to what's happening inside, it's a, a long move. Uh, what is the move? You see, I simply no. change two paths and there's a line. I crossed it. So this one and this one. I cross them within a time slice. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an allowed move. Yeah, why wouldn't do that? So what you're saying is that I just start from there to, to the next one. You see, I, I attach this to this right. and I attach this to well, because the problem is that this is we have a discrete we have discretized the action. Yes, it is. You can you can what happens you see in between those two time slices it's you don't control so it's because allowed. You, it is allowed that you have a time step you error. No, but you have a time. Yeah, but you have a time step error. Do you sample them? Or not? No. I think they should be. No, because uh, here this. I don't think you have an argument. No, you don't. No, no. I'm sorry. This is a discretization. You can say, well, since I'm discretizing, I can ignore what happens in between. Yeah, sure, but you have a time step error. You you don't know what's happening in between. So no. When it, what, when this line starts and when it ends, you don't know. Right. You can continue. No, no, no. Want you have thrown away arbitrarily paths where particles would cross. You have a time step error. In principle, if you reduce your time step error, you will have a line there, and then you will realize, ah, that path wasn't there. You can, but you have a time step error because you are ignoring what's happening between the two. Zero probability because they, they 
genetic part of you know, the 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 way way you yeah. Too yeah. So the, the point is, in this scale, you have to change of the way it's used. Yeah, I mean, you don't see you don't see the crossing because it's a time step error. You can allow if you want to. So it's a question of in practice, in practice, the kinetic energy difference for any move that, that you might try like that is huge. And so the probability of accepting that right. relative to other moves is essentially zero. I don't agree. Yeah, this is, this is actually, if you want to do an arbitrary exchange, get an arbitrary two pass. You can, you, because you're ignoring the potential energy in between. That's the thing. Yeah. You do this between an open line and a closed line. No. Because there is no potential energy in that case. I am missing the particle, which is why I do not bring two particles close together. Yeah. That's the key point. If you, if you uh, create, a, you know, if you go across the side and there is no particle, you eliminate one. Exactly, one yeah. Thing, so you wait for it. Yeah. It's all about the acceptance. You are, you are being killed here by the acceptance. You simply say, theoretically, it's possible, but it, it probably is 10 to the minus No, 20. you could, in principle, say, okay, I am going to reconnect this right. to this one and this right. to this one. You can. There is no potential energy in between because I have discretized. Right. But the discretization is, a, is an approximation. Right. The yeah. moment... Yeah, in general, you could insert half of the time slice, and you will see that the energy will go up. Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah. That's the key point. You know, if you s in insert half of the time slice, and you check the energy for the exchange, it will go out of the room. And probably you will... Yeah, eventually you will have to think of, you, you will have to deal with what's happening between the right. two. Yeah. Hey, you just slice the tau one half and look at the energy, yeah. what they yeah. will be doing. Yeah. It's obvious yeah. that they move it out. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. this argument is correct in one dimension. Once you're in two or three dimensions, they can correct and make like this. Right, but the problem is that the time step becomes smaller, then the kinetic energy that you have to pay becomes large. No, no, it's not true. <laughs> okay, uh, so well, this is self-complementary, and the uh, acceptance probability at this point is the same, and the the z i and z l are a probability table of possible swaps. Here too, you have to create a table because you have to decide to which word lines you will you will reconnect. So uh, let's make a few remarks here. The configurations with open world lines will contribute to the Matsubara green function. So in principle, you will have one line. If you have only one open line, you're calculating the one particle Matsubara green function. You can have several open lines. For two, you can calculate the two particle green function. You cannot have too many because at that point, uh, the likelihood of uh, reclosing everything becomes, becomes a, it's a power law, but it can become significant. Uh, not sure why you would go after three or four particles, but you might. Now, all the non-trivial topological path updates occur in the G sector, not in the Z sector. And uh, now, the swap moves enjoy still high acceptance, even with hardcore potential, precisely because since you don't have particles in that portion of the word line, you're not going to hit hardcores. And, uh, um, when finally Air and Masha will reconnect and will do that only when it is favorable, uh, uh, the, we, you will obtain a Z sector configuration. And uh, most of the observable computed, which are usually diagonal, we, um, uh, will be computed in the Z sector. And large permutation cycles will automatically occur. So now one uh, common misconception is that one has to be sitting there and wait for Ira and Masha to reconnect. Now, in the, in the, uh, in, on lattice, it's like that, all right? But in the continuum, no, you have to have a move, and it is the move of, the, of closure. So you don't have to wait for, the, for them to come together. You sample the reconnection. So the number of particles will fluctuate, all right? Now, a canonical implementation is also possible. It's simple. You just fix, uh, you, you can force your system to move between n minus 1 and n. So you only have one um, open line, and you do not change the number of particles. Now, is it possible for Ir and Masha to get stuck away from each other? Well, so in the presence of, um, uh, first of all, the statistics of spatial distances is given by the one-body density matrix, all right? So in a non-Bose-Einstein condensate, this decays exponentially, which means that it will never go very far away. 
All right? Uh, on the other hand, in a Bose condensate, they will be able to go very far away by definition, all right? Uh, on the other hand, you have a high acceptance probability of reconnection, just because you have those large permutations. So this turns out not to be a problem in practice. So when we say large moves, let's see, for example, here, uh, we, are, we have a simulation of helium-4 in two dimensions. I could have made it bigger, but I mean, uh, this is just uh, for, for illustration. Here we have 200 particles. Uh, we are at a temperature of 0.6 Kelvin, uh, close to the superfluid transition, um, slightly below the superfluid transition. And these are the paths of individual particles. And what I am drawing here is one long cycle of permutation, which involves 54 of the 200 particles. As you see, this cycle spans the cell in both the x and y direction. And these are precisely the permutations that give origin to winding. So let's look at some results. This is the study of the superfluid transition in helium-4, OK? So these are numbers from Seperly and Pollock, who could do 25 particles in 1989. Um, and uh, these are their error bars. In 1998, they uh, attempted again the same calculation. They did 30 particles. So here we have results for 200 and for 2,500 particles. And we have an estimate of the uh, transition temperature. We are, here we are in, in two dimensions. And uh, you, know, you have costalist Taules fo formalism that you know, allows one to, to uh, make use, um, a profitable use of numerical data. What, see, what is important is that the ability of going to large system sizes allows you to sample more accurately the critical region. Uh, there, if you try to do, to use that, the uh, KT formalism, the um, KT recursive equations using these data, you end up with a 0.75. So it's a dec decent difference with respect to what you get if you can go this high in terms of system size. Here is uh, the, the uh, superfluid fraction uh, for 3D helium-4 at the equilibrium density. So here is what happens if you start from 64 particles and you keep adding uh, particles so you go up by a factor of two each time and all the way up to 2048. You see, it is true that uh, as you increase the system size, your, your curve approaches the black curve, which is experiment. All right? But as you see, uh, one has to work really hard in order to approach it. And the, the closer you are, the harder it becomes to make the, the, the one uh, final step. So in this situation, one has to resort to finite size scaling. All right? And in order to do finite size scaling, as I, sh I will show you, it's very important that one um, have uh, at uh, one's disposal sufficiently, I mean, first of all, a sufficiently l sufficient number of system sizes, but also significantly different from each other. So you see, you have all of these lines. Uh, you can use the, the, the scaling quantities L rho S. Now, all of these lines actually do not have to cross at the same point because there are correction to scaling. What would happen is that um, they, if you take, for example, 64 and 128, they cross right here. Then 128 and 512, they cross slightly to the right. And if you do that, the, move, uh, the point keeps moving to the right. Uh, this is a U1 superfluid um, uh, phase transition. And so it falls in a well-defined universality class. You know actually that this is where, at this level, is where the crossing should occur in the thermodynamic limit. And you can use all of this information to give uh, an estimate of the superfluid transition temperature. And you come up with a number which is 2.193. Here. We Finite size, it's finite size scale in theory. Um, no, the, the black line, you see the particles of black line, where they come from? It's a, I do not know the specific, it's a universal result. I mean, if uh, the superfluid transition in three dimensions fall in a certain universality class, no, there no, are. I know, but where the line comes from? From, from, from that theory, that theory also gives you that. I can find out, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamental result. Um, that's all I know. So you can use that. You don't have to, but it makes it easier if you can use that particular information. And you have to look at this particular quantity. To, to scaling, yes, there are. But the, the, that the crossing should occur there, no. I think, it is a, I think it is a fairly robust theoretical result. But I don't know where it comes from. 
Um, now, the superfluid transition temperature measured experimentally is 2.178. Now, Tc is not universal, so there is no reason to expect that uh, th this value should be the same um, because we're using the Aziz potential. I mean, there is a, a microscopic model that is, uh, that is underlying the calculation. However, the universality class is the same. Now, one other reason uh, for uh, wanting to access large system sizes uh, oftentimes, one could say, uh, you, if you take 64 particles, you get the energy right, the pair correlation function right. OK, you get the superfluid density um, not quite right, uh, but uh, you get the qualitative physics correct. Now, here, one problem is if you're looking at the one body density matrix, uh, the blue uh, points are where you would stop if uh, you were to uh, do 64 particles. Huh? What is this one body density matrix? The one body density matrix. No, it's, it's, a, it's a function, it's not a matrix. It's a one body, people call it one body density matrix. Oh, so it's a, a dagger R A R prime. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, it's, so it's a difference between R and So R. it depends on R minus R prime if the system is, of course, uh, uh, isotropic and homogeneous. In the general case, it will not, but you know, it's, yeah. So this is the one body density matrix. And people, so this is where it would, it would uh, stop right there uh, with 64 particles. And you see, if you were to evaluate it at 2.14, uh, which is slightly below the superfluid transition temperature, this is where you would stop. And it would give you around a value of above 4%. In practice, if you, if you can continue, but you never see it saturate. In the presence of, uh, uh, of a condensate, this is supposed to go to a constant. And the value, the asymptotic value, is the condensate fraction. So here you would be stuck evaluating the condensate fraction and putting it at 4.5% or whatever you want to pick. Whereas in this particular case, if you can continue on, you see that the, 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 the value goes down. Now you could say that this is helium-4, liquid helium-4, and therefore it doesn't really make much difference after all if you get 4.5 or, or a bit less than 4%. And this might be a valid argument. Uh, a, mo a more crucial situation is what I will describe in the next slide, uh, where one is looking for possible Bose-Einstein condensate in, in solid helium-4. Now, all of these results perhaps now are uh, less relevant given the fact that uh, phenomenology pointing possibly to a super solid phase of, of uh, helium-4 seems to be now more easily interpreted in, in other ways. But nevertheless, uh, we are interested in establishing whether one can have um, off diagonal long range order in a solid, in solid helium-4. So these are simulations for, for uh, uh, about 1,000 particles, 1,000 helium-4 atoms. Uh, oh, 800. Um, and uh, we are looking at the one body density matrix at a temperature of 0.2 Kelvin. And uh, in this situation, you have a zero value of the superfluid density. And concurrently, we see that at two different uh, densities, this one is much above uh, the melting line. This is slightly above. You see that in both cases, there is a clear exponential decay of the one body density matrix. And that gives, an imp gives a, a, a sense of uh, absence of, of diagonal long range order. This is actually a result, uh, which is uh, the fact that this, there is an exponential decay is independent of pressure, even though the decay is different at higher pressure. But, uh, and it's consistent with the absence of superfluidity. And the fact that both the one body density matrix and the superfluid density are associated to long permutation cycles. No, it's point two. Temperature so uh, this one is, uh, I think it is about 30 bars. Say that again. That's right. So this one is approximately 30 bars, I think. And this is, I think, is 155. Right, right. So the, the melting uh, density is 0 0.0287. Angstrom to the minus 3. All right. S yeah, no, 20 is, um, 
is the minimum you need to crystallize, I think. Something like that. 25, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, one application that uh, of I feel is particularly telling is the fact that uh, one can calculate the activation energy for vacancies and interstitials uh, using the Matsubara Green function, which is not just a convenient way to do the sampling, but there's actually physics um, associated to it. Uh, so the idea here is the following. One of the possible scenarios of supersolidity in helium-4 has to do with uh, uh, ground state uh, point defects, like vacancies or interstitials. In order to understand, or possibly thermally activated too, at, at, at low temperature. One way to um, obtain an order of magnitude estimate for the activation energy is to calculate the one body, uh, the, the, one, the Matsubara one particle green function, and at k equal to zero, all right, uh, so you take a Fourier transform, uh, a, a spatial Fourier transform, as a function of tau, this will asymptotically de uh, decay as e to the minus. The, uh, tau delta, and delta is the activation energy. So you do that in the sector of the vacancy, negative time, or in the sector of the interstitials, and from the slope you infer uh, the value of the activation energy, which is th about 13 Kelvin for a vacancy and about 23 for an interstitial. So this is an important quantitative information because that means that the temperatures of the experiment at which people were speculating to see super solid helium, uh, the, the concentration of vacancies of interst or interstitials that you could look at would be, would be really small. Uh, again, this, in order to do this in the canonical ensemble without having access to the Matsubara green function, you have to manually add uh, one vacancy or an interstitial. You do two simulations and you try to subtract the energy. In the thermodynamic limit, you are subtracting to extensive quantities and it becomes extremely difficult. Uh, whereas in this case, you have it directly in, in, in uh, one simulation. So there is, there is an advantage to, be, to, to being able to access this particular object. Uh, so this is the, um, no, if you calculate it like that, yes. Mm. Yeah, if you, if you do it like that, yes, it doesn't really, it doesn't really change. I mean, it's, uh, you know, to show that you can obtain a decent estimate, but you don't know that a priori, yeah. Yeah, no, no, and yeah, fair enough, fair enough, yes, yeah. So in this particular case, if you did it in the, no, so in this particular case, I suppose if you did it the traditional way, you could probably get away with it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think David did did do that, and he got numbers r not quite the same. If equal zero, if equal zero got more or less things to always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the vacancy was was a bit off, but the interstitial was five, if I remember correctly. You never did interstitial, but the, the, for the vacancies, I mean, the, the numbers sort of like uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you're talking about you know, the calculation in which you were involved, maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay, no, but he did it. Uh, didn't he did it again. Okay, and okay. And know that not much changed. Okay. Essentially. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting that it doesn't change with size either. So that's <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> so now it's surprising. See, I, I want to interpret this without the numbers. You see, don't mean much for me. So you have a gas which is 25 Kelvin. Your statement is that the depth. Look at the temperature of the order 30 Kelvin. You don't have a solid. Is that the correct statement or not? Irrespective of pressure. Uh, at the temperature of 30 Kelvin, you don't have a solid. I'm asking. Yes. But that depends on the density, I guess. Uh, I'm asking. No, see, so, so, so I'm asking, do you have a solid at that temperature in order to see this this uh, defects moving around? Because what you made the statement earlier that the temperature which they made the experiment is very low in comparison with this. With the gap, yes. It's very low. So probably you see that the concentration of those is so low that it's, yeah. it's meaningless yeah. to talk about. So now the question is, is there a realizable situation in practice where this can be observed? Is, so is there a solid at a temperature around 30 Kelvin for some pressure? Mm, there is, but I don't think that the gap would be 30 Kelvin. Right. At so, so, yeah. So so I, no, I don't know if there is, uh, if, the, if those conditions, we have so done. If we increase the pressure, that gap can go up and down. Yeah, 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 and yeah. The, the pressure is visible in the lab. I think that's about, it's pretending, I mean, there is a way to get the solar. I, I think it's about 300 gigapascals. 
No, no, you can. If you compress it, you will get a solid at room temperature. But uh, uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard. Well, you can. You, you don't even need the diamond anvil cell, I don't think. You, 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 you can get there. Uh, the, but the gap will be pressure dependent. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you have an idea how that's dangerous? No. No. So this nullifies the fact that you have a solid with this mechanism, a super solid with this mechanism. It's a strong, uh, strong, strong evidence against one particular mechanism that would give you super solidity. Um, now, it turns out recently it appears as if uh, what was interpreted initially as evidence of super solid response is actually due to something else. So, you know. Now, um, another thing that I would like to mention, again, all of these are perhaps only of academic interest at this point, but one thing that we but managed to do. Hmm? That's right. That is right. That is right. Uh, that's the that's you know. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. That's right. So um, one of the things that people were interested in in those days was also to establish whether one could have superfluidity at a grain boundary between uh, where the two crystallites meet. Now, in order to do that, um, you, you need large systems because you have to have a, a bona fide representation of the grain boundary. And it turns out you can do it with you have 30, but you have to have 13,000 particles at least, all right? And we actually managed to do that. And one of the results of this study is that, in fact, a generic grain boundary is, can be superfluid. Um, um, there are um, insulating grain boundaries as, as well, and it depends on the relative orientation of the crystallites. The point here is that a study like that is doable, and uh, uh, it shows that one can conceivably have uh, superfluidity. Another case in which one can have a superfluid is inside the core of a screw dislocation in solid helium-4. This, again, in the context of supersolid helium may not be terribly relevant anymore. However, it appears as if there is a theory that one can put together based on this result where one would develop a, a, a three-dimensional um, super solid or super fluid um, by interconnecting channels, uh, one-dimensional channels, inside which you have a, a, a Lottinger liquid, which can be regarded as a one-dimensional super fluid mm, with a, a lot of caveats. Uh, there is a theory due to Shevchenko um, uh, to the effect that if you have an interconnected network of uh, such one-dimensional channels, you can actually develop a, a, a three-dimensional superfluid. Um, now, this may not be relevant in helium-4, although we did find that inside the core of a screw dislocation, and here too you need a lot of particles, you have uh, several thousand, uh, you can have a, a, a quasi-one-dimensional superfluid. It may not be terribly relevant to, to solid helium anymore, but it is an interesting idea perhaps to pursue in the context of a uh, porous network, like porous glasses, all right, uh, like Vicor. Um, that may be worthwhile uh, exploring further. And experimentally, a lot of effort is ongoing in terms of uh, understanding the superfluid properties of helium inside porous glasses. Now, one last thing I'd like to mention is this. Um, we don't have to worry about long exchanges only in the context of superfluidity, because it turns out they can be quite important in, uh, uh, in addressing other issues. So for example, here you have a system that is uh, very popular these days. Uh, you have a two-dimensional system of dipoles, so um, di polar molecules. So say you have a two-dimensional system of bosons with a dipole moment, either electric or magnetic, aligned perpendicularly to the plane, for example, with an electric field. And it's confined in two dimensions by you know, uh, magnetic fields. People can apparently do these things these days. And so you have a Hamiltonian, which can be, to a good approximation, written down like that. We are, of course, neglecting the fact that we have a finite system, because uh, if you have a purely repulsive interaction, the thing doesn't stay together. But Within a specific uh, limit, it is meaningful to, to study this object. So let's look at the phase diagram. And one can look at the phase diagram. This is written in natural units. So in this Hamiltonian, you have two parameters. One is the interparticle distance, Rs, just like in the electron gas. And then you have the reduced temperature. And the temperature scale is 1 over Rs squared. So um, yeah. Uh, 
Um, Um, I think you know we're we have bare dipole should go as one over r cubed. I think. Yeah, but if I integrate it with the volume, you see, the dimensional volume, I think that I got a juice, right? Um, so but we are in two dimensions. This is two dimensions. Yeah. But it may still diverge. I don't know. I don't know. No, we are in two dimensions. My yeah. Yeah. Two dimensions is just diverge. Yeah. Barely. Yeah. In three dimensions, you wouldn't be able to do it because uh, uh, it would collapse in the sense that you cannot guarantee purely, I mean, not with dipoles anyway, you cannot guarantee purely repulsive. In two dimensions. Well, it depends on the external field if you have this warm and six normal field, you see that you orient all the dipoles. Yeah, but if you are one over the other, they, there will be a collapse. In, in two dimensions, you can because they're all parallel. In three dimensions, I, I don't know. I have no idea. So the. So let's take ourselves, so, and people have used, uh, have uh, been interested in determining the, the phase diagram of this object at low temperature. And the idea is, you know, just like in the electron gas, where is, it a where is the um, equilibrium phase a crystal or where, it is, where is it a superfluid? Now let's take uh, Rs of this value, uh, the value of Rs like that, and uh, let's ask ourselves uh, at this temperature, what is the equilibrium phase? Now, we start from a system in which you know, we, we take a, a, a square simulation cell and we neglect statistics altogether. So we call these Boltzmannons. In other words, you have zero point motion, but you do not have exchanges. So uh, as you can see, and uh, this is a square cell, um, a crystal in two dimensions is triangular. You do not let the system form a triangular crystal because you give a, a square cell, but you see that the system does it anyway. It just tilts it. Okay, so uh, you find that you know in this particular case you would ascribe to the to the system a, a crystal um, uh, structure. Now, the moment you turn on permutations, this is what happens: you immediately create long cycles, and uh, the system turns superfluid as these long uh, cycles of exchange of identical particles start occurring, and you lose the structure. Okay, so you are in the vicinity of a first order phase transition and in order to determine correctly the phase boundaries you do uh, crucially need exchanges and here we're talking about No, no, so this would be average because it's instantaneous, but the only Yes, but once you know that you have one of them, then you will know that the system will continue to be in that in that particular phase Right, but I mean, okay, I'm not showing the pair correlation function. If I showed you the pair correlation function, you would see that there is a difference between the two phases. So, um, so in this particular situation, the system, in this case, the system can lower its energy by forming a quasi Bose Einstein condensate and by losing solid order. Now, you may think that this is a, a particular, a peculiar system, but actually, the same is true. If you look at helium-4, so we have a computer experiment here, the same identical computer experiment for helium-4. Let's just take the standard microscopic model based on the Aziz pair potential, the same that I have used in all the previous calculations. So let's go to 0.5 Kelvin, and let's put ourselves at a temperature of 0 0.0, at a density of 0 0.0248 angstrom, and here we are well into the superfluid phase. We are not at equilibrium, we are slightly pressurized, but we are still in the superfluid phase. Uh, the pressure is approximately 15 bars here. So we do the simulation, and we neglect exchanges, and this is what Nikolai called volume, not sure how, well, anyway. So the, what you find is that, again, we are in a, in a cubic cell. And um, we start out from uh, you know, an initial condition that doesn't have any resemblance of order. As you run the, the thing uh, long enough, you see that the solid starts forming. Okay. Again, here too, this is just a, a, a snapshot. I could show you the pair correlation function and show you that it that does have much higher peaks than the pair correlation function that you get if you turn on exchanges. And all of this, if I were to show you the corresponding image in that particular case, this would be all red because all the particles are connected to cycles everywhere. Okay. And the pair correlation functions would again show the, 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 the difference. So, what is the, the, the situation here? First of all, we have 
108 um, atoms and they crystallize regardless of the cell geometry and or of the initial arrangement. So this is something like a spontaneous crystallization or thermal crystallization that we find upon neglecting exchanges. Now here, if you calculate the pressure in this exercise, you find that you're very close to zero bars. I'm sorry, okay. this is two or three dimensions. Three. So I'm cutting through, a, uh, I'm, I'm showing you the xy plane. But, but because the unit is about 10 on the side, you calculate So these are angstroms. Yeah. So the density. Then, yeah. That's everything projected. That's right. No, everything you're integrating. You're looking. You're looking. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, no, these are not 108. So the, the, so the simulations actually strongly suggest that helium-4 itself would be a crystal at this temperature if atoms were indeed distinguishable. All right? So in the case of helium-4 as well, uh, the phase diagram is strongly influenced by um, uh, both statistics. All right? And um, um, not just to the liquid solid phase boundary, where you would expect, but also far away from it, because here we are very far away. The, the melting density, the freezing density is 0.0267, all right? So we're far away. I mean, again, the pressure should be about 25 bars. We're still at 15. But here, too, if exchanges did not exist, we would have actually, a, a helium would be a crystal, OK? Um, Except that boundaries usually favor the, 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 the liquid phase, not the crystal. Well, yeah. if it no. takes one particle, yeah. you see, then, then not necessarily. Uh, 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 even at zero temperature, we, we have done simulations in which, with 108 particles, simple, uh, more or less same conditions, you get uh, a crystal, a perfectly nice crystal, with 500 mm -hmm. ways, I mean, almost no ways to, to get a crystal. Mm, I'm a bit surprised. You can take a finite system, give the right boundary, and you will see a crystal, say, with some Leonard or potential possibility. You go to a larger thing, and the crystal falls apart. Ma ma mm. Max, in fact, I mean, it's a bit different. Mm. OK, all right. Well, we tried this with, uh, it's hard to go to very large system sizes here. I. With helium, that really uh, you know wants to be a, a, a fluid. A again, if I were to turn exchanges on, all right, this would be a liquid right away. Okay, I mean this in this particular case, I doubt if this is a, a boundary effect. If it is a boundary effect, nevertheless, and the pressure is close to zero. In any case, it does suggest that the line would be moved significantly to the left. Okay. So Pair correlation function, st static structure factor. But there could be finite, but there could be finite size effect on that too. Yeah, but if there are finite size effects, there are going to be finite size effects on that too, of that one too. So um, let's talk about open. Since I'm running out of time, let's talk about open issues. And there are, of course, now the sign problem stays. Okay. Well, as far as I can tell, it's neither improved nor worsened by the worm algorithm. I suppose one could consider using the fixed node restriction uh, introduced by separately in 1992. In principle, it is also applicable um, to, to the worm algorithm. I suppose there, are, there might be problems to solve. You have uh, to implement. If you want to be in the grand canonical ensemble, I guess you have to take into account the fact that you have the two dangling ends. Mm, that, I believe, can, can, can be incorporated in the formal. It's not sure how easily, but mm, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be. In the canonical ensemble, it, you, know, you, are, you have a bit more freedom because you don't really care about the additional configurations that you're creating with um, the, the, the two dangling ends are physical or not. As long as there are well-defined rules to move from, the, from your uh, extended space back into the physical space, there is, a, there is not a problem. So you might even be able to relax the constraint in the, in the G sector. But I don't know. I haven't explored that. Now, is there any way to avoid the time step error? Uh, there are 
appears to be no way. I mean, uh, f uh, until now, we haven't been able to come up with a, a, a way to, to get rid of this discretization error in the continuum. It comes from the fact that you do not, do not have the same expansion for the kinetic energy that you have on, uh, on a lattice. Now, um, this certainly can run into problem with, with whenever multi-particle updates are needed. So close to first order phase transitions, I can certainly think of situations in which you might need you know, cluster, cluster updates. I haven't run into one of them yet, but certainly this is one situation in which this algorithm presumably would run into, into, into issues. Now, the uh, accessing dynamical information is simple, relatively simple in terms of computing imaginary time correlations because you have everything already right there, and it's just a matter of, of uh, accumulating averages. Naturally, we still have the problem that we are in imaginary time, and we are facing the same difficulty as everybody else is, namely, you know, go from, from uh, imaginary time back to the uh, physical uh, frequency domain. So uh, this algorithm doesn't do anything in terms of addressing that particular issue. If you're interested in the main reference, this is the paper. And um, at this point, I can just thank you for your attention.